Good morning, Giants. Welcome to Wake Up with Giants TV. Have you ever wondered how to achieve the life you were meant to live? We've got a guest for you. Good morning, Giants. Welcome to Wake Up with Giants TV. I'm Ryan Morris, and as always, I'm here with your host, Nicholas T. Smith, the MG. That's the mystical giant. If you haven't subscribed on YouTube, go ahead and do that now. Now. <laughs> and now. We'll do and, that. now. and now. Or join yeah. us on the, on the Tribe of Giants on Facebook. If YouTube isn't your thing, come Come join our wonderful group. Uh, well, will you introduce our guest today? I will. I will. But I want to speak to that a little more. I mean, if you don't subscribe on YouTube, we're going to develop some unhealthy coping skills <laughs> and we're going to have to talk about that. So make sure you go do it so we don't go down that road. Right. No yeah. guilt. No we shame. <laughs> <laughs> no manipulation. We apply guilt to our, yeah. our listeners. <laughs> right. So I want to welcome. We got John Patrick Morgan, JP Morgan, not the banker, the philosopher, yeah. the teacher, the coach, the individual. The better one. Yeah. He's he's intent on helping people live a beautiful life. So for two decades, uh, for those that don't math, that's 20 years. <laughs> he's been supporting entrepreneurs, athletes, and artists and growing their peace, joy, and success through growing themselves. So students of his work share an obsession with self-mastery and a deep value of freedom, love, and personal power. Mm-hmm. And through hundreds of videos, online classes, confronting yet compassionate dialogue. Uh, He helps people to discover how their mind creates their reality and how through opening their heart, they can access deeper fulfillment, more power, and exponentially, and I love that word, Mm -hmm. greater material results in their life and their work. JP, welcome to the show. Wow, that was awesome, man. I haven't read that in a long time. It's like so... It's fun. it's super accurate. It's yeah, that was, that that was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Good. Well you did that. Yeah, you wrote <laughs> I don't know that. if I wrote that or somebody else, but that was yeah. pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah it uh, it is powerful. It's it's to the point. And um, I've had some experience. I've I've had the opportunity to sit with you on the park bench, and that was beautiful. Mm-hmm. And now we're really going to dive in. Cool. And, and go through your story. So I think the big thing that we want to connect is that you have your own journey that's unique and individual. And when we look at the giant's journey, it's unique for every individual, but there mm. are similarities in it. Yeah. And so I think where a lot of people get hung up is they look at their childhood or their start point and they think, well, I didn't have it that way. So I can't, mm. or, you know, my parents were giants and, you know, I, I just didn't want to go down that, you know, just something. Mm, mm, mm. So I'm curious about your start point. Where, mm. where did you start going all the way back in time? What was it like growing up? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to go there? Yeah, I do. I mean, like um, one of the core challenges in my life has been feeling small. Um, okay. My dad's uh, six, six. Uh, I'm like five, eight, five, <laughs> eight and a half on a good day. So you're talking physically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And he was John and I'm John. So he's, I'm a junior. And so in my family, the way to differentiate us, it was Big John and Little John. Mm. And obviously that was like an age point in the beginning, but that became like very much relevant for me around size. Um, my dad was a cop. So good guys, bad guys, big, small. I had this like dichotomy that I grew up in. Um, yeah. You know, part of it was a gift. Like I learned right from wrong. I really got a strong sense of value of doing the right thing. Um, but I saw my dad as powerful. He went, he became an entrepreneur, left being the police force, made money. And so I started to associate things like making more money, having power in the world with being big. And so I got, and then we moved schools when I was in like fourth grade from, from a town to another town and, and uh, just got picked on. I kind of showed up with the um, small idea got bullied, picked on, didn't really have any friends, pushed around. Um, and, you know, in, in, in thinking about, I have boys now, I have a one-year-old and a five-year-old, and I think about like, oh, would I even know if they were getting picked on? Because my parents had no idea. Right. I and mean, I didn't tell them. It's such a weird thing. You don't come home and tell your parents. But it was like, you know, I have like really powerful images from when I was a kid, just like in fourth grade, getting pushed around, being singled out, being alone, 
being alone on the swings where all the other kids are playing kickball and it's like fuck. even just talking about it right now it's still it's so powerful wow it's so yeah. powerful um and it wasn't until my parents finally let me learn martial arts that i got a taste of what it was to be big in a, in a very kind of crude sense just fought back a few times when there were bullies um and that whole part of my life just changed you know and i'm not promoting violence and it but it was like defending myself physically and finding out that i had a kind of power gave me a, a sense of safety and security and um I mean, i haven't been in a fight since i was like in my early teens but that was a turning point for me and i got that i can be big even without being big okay um and i went on this journey of like seeking power in different forms and in the beginning it was like the power to be safe a power over others because so they didn't have power over me um but a power became a fascination with me in life um and it's taken on and it's evolved but in the beginning it was really like to protect myself then it was like to be powerful academically and started to excel in high school and, and and got good grades um and then it was like when i got out of school and in business it was like financial power how can i create more capacity to be big in these ways but it wasn't until my late 20s early 30s that i really could see that a lot of my seeking of power was trying to get away from that feeling with the kids playing kickball and me being on the swing and so it was like trying to be powerful because deep down i feared and believed that i wasn't because i believed that i was small hmm. um, and it was the spiritual journey that i went on to come more in touch with that inner child that like seeking power as a as a response to the fear of being small that i was able to start to forgive myself for judging myself as a small person and allow the genuineness of my bigness to shine through instead yeah. of it being like a fix, like being self more self-expressed. And my relationship with power these days now in my early forties is that power is, is, is our yearning to create. So it's like the power to create, not to power over others. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a snapshot of the inner journey. Oh, no, that's beautiful. You, 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 you said something there that I don't think people will catch unless I point this out, mm. but you said, I forgave myself or I forgive myself for judging myself. Mm. And it's such a unique way of saying that. I I have a, a thought of where the source is for that. Mm. And if we can go down that road a little bit yeah. about these judgments, right? And how what we're really forgiving is our judgments of ourselves or, or our judgments of others. Can you talk about mm -hmm. that a little bit? Yeah, I believe that who we that we experience the world. And we perceive the world through how we conceptualize ourselves and the world. Mm. And that's the story. That's an identity. That's an idea. That's a habit. That's a conditioning. That's a judgment of what is. Yeah. Whether the what is is out there or the what is is me. It's a everything is like a function of consciousness and language is to judge. The bite of the apple off the tree of knowledge, the birth of language is judgment. Mm. It's creation and form. And that can be a judgment from love. It can be judgment from fear. It's a, it's a creation. And so I unknowingly, unwittingly decided that I am small. I'm little. I took that on and I made it mean. It was like a neural network had been built in my whole body, in my mind, that was like that. Uh, uh, so I forgive myself for doing that because I think. Yeah, wow. Yeah, right there. One of the things that people do with self-awareness is as soon as they become aware of a way of self-functioning, like the first, you become aware of like, oh my God, I have thinking, I think I am this. And they, what they do is they take that awareness and they weaponize it. Yeah, they flog with it, right? Yeah. They judge themselves for judging themselves. Yeah. And it's like, it just like becomes like, like Loctite. It's like, and so the most important thing I've discovered in my spiritual growth, personal growth is how I meet that, which I become aware of within myself huh. more than anything else. If I can meet that with forgiveness and lightness and innocence, then, then I've got way more possibility for evolution. I got to write that down. So some of this will be a pause because I'm typing, but yeah, <laughs> yeah what was that, what was that too. moment too, uh, JP, what was that moment when you did fully recognize, was there a, like a, something that woke you up to recognize that you were originally seeking power over others and then versus, um, you know, recognizing that, uh, um, you know, just that shift. Was there a was there a particular moment or an event I mean, that happened? 
I could try to make up a story that there was, but there's just a number of like parts of the, and aspects and things. You had, that you had a choice to, right there. You could yeah. have made up well, the coolest story ever. I was sitting under a ever. tree and a bug <laughs> crawled over to my ankle and like light came down. And then I was just like, I, I can see everything. Yeah. Angels. No. I mean, <laughs> that's the same <laughs> story I have. Well, it's it's amazing. There's always a tree or an animal or something. That's like, a, yeah. Yeah. Um, was so, it more of a sick and tired of being sick and tired type of thing? It was an evolution, man. It's okay, like yeah. I'm, I'm a chop wood, carry water guy. I'm a <laughs> philosopher. I like, you know, I just chip away at it. But I'll tell you the different ways, like the different contributions to this understanding and, and access points. Um, one is I studied physics and math at university. Yeah. And so I had a relationship to power that was outside of the. I also had like a fit, just pure physics understanding of what power is in the mathematical sense. And in that domain, there's no like good, wrong, bad. It's just like power is work divided by time, which essentially is the change made to a system divided by the time it takes to make that change. Or said more simply, the difference you make divided by the time it makes it takes to make that difference. That's all power is. And so I had a way of seeing power as purely neutral. Hmm. And then I could contrast that against my experience of power coming from fear versus also this like this year, like wanting to go out as a kid into the, into the forest and build a tree fort. And it was like this expression of capacity to bring into creation. And that, that was like, there's, I that still have of, that desire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I want to go, go build a fort right yeah. now. <laughs> but to, but to that, that to me, that's like that, that, you know, and I also studied Nietzsche and he talks about the will to power that we are the will to power, but I don't think he meant power over others. It's like this, this yearning, the desire to go build a tree fort. Like that's the essence of living. And it's like, you know, I call it creation, this, this, com this compulsion, this desire, this movement to create. Um, and so, you know, it's just through reflecting on that, but also in parallel of starting to become more attuned to when I am acting out of fear versus out of love. And then starting to see the correlation between that kind of power becoming from fear versus the other kind coming from love. Um, so yeah, it's just been a journey. There's no one point. And, and, and I'm still on it. Like literally this morning in my journal, I was just noticing this little subtle feeling of being small. And so it's like going in, where's that coming from? What's that about? Getting in touch with it, seeing my innocence, forgiving myself or judging myself. It's not like, oh, I did it back there and now I'm free. Hmm. It's to me, it's like, you know, paint the fence, wax the car. You know, I'm constantly evolving and practicing. I yeah. love that you brought in a little karate kid right there. That's, oh, yeah, uh, that's Cobra Kai. Badass. <laughs> <Or a> bit, <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, and, and also too, I'm like as we were talking, shirt. I could see the I could see the emotions coming up as you're reliving mm -hmm. a little bit of your childhood, right? Mm -hmm. And so doing that, I think every now and again is actually probably pretty healthy because it helps you see your blind spots and mm -hmm. see what comes up for you. Mm -hmm. And then you can address those and and um maybe strengthen or uh, use those to help others in their yeah. feelings and in their journeys as well. That's why we do this too, is to help others in their journey. And I think that's, mm. that's good. Cause there's a lot of people that I think could relate to being bullied or feeling out of place or feeling small. They might not know how to, to go back and unpack some of that stuff. Yeah. Well, if I'm honest, like I do this for me mm. right? and it benefits others. Mm -hmm. So the, the truth is that it benefits me to be on an interview with somebody and really learn from them. Mm -hmm. And it also inspires others. Yeah. So there's, there's a sense that it serves. And, and what I want to hit on what Ryan hit on is that when you're journaling and you're really feeling, just the don't hit on me. I won't hit on you. Yeah. So the, the emotion of it, right? People do the journaling as a checklist mm -hmm. and there's no emotion in it. It's automated mm -hmm. and it's a to do, but when you really sit with the emotion of it, like you do, and you really pay attention to the subtle nuances in your experience, then it really allows you to bring that up. And mm -hmm. like you said, forgive your judgments of it because you're doing the best you knew how to do at the time. Yeah, that's right. So what comes up as you hear that? Um, there's a practice that I developed called speak, see, feel. Okay. Um, and it's an inversion or reversal of a practice I learned from Shinzen Young, the Buddhist uh, uh, Zen Buddhist um, meditation teacher, which is see, hear, feel. I learned from him, but I think it's a, just a Vipassana practice, which is you go in time inside your mind and you, if you have a thought, if you see something, you say to yourself, seeing, 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 and then you come back to your breath. If you mm -hmm. feel something, feel, feel, feel back to your breath here, here, here. And so that process is 
to help you to break apart your internal experience so you can disassociate from it. Mm, okay, yeah, yep. I've invert, I, and I use that, but I've also created an inversion, which I call speak, see, feel, because while we want to disassociate and be mindful and not believe that we are our experience, yeah, and that can really help to create freedom, forgiveness, innocence. For me, the journaling is sometimes that movement, helping me to kind of like see what's going on so I can get out of it. But a lot of what I do in my journal um, is essentially speak, see, feel. I write as a way of creating an internal speaking. Okay. And the only reason that I would say something internally is so that I can see an image in my mind. It's like the speaking guides the imagery. And when I can see an image in my mind, then I have access to the feeling of that image. Huh. And so it's like this directional way of actually bringing me into an experience. And so if I speak, see, feel that I am giant, it's like I speak it, but then like what, and then I'm speaking as a way of looking. Yeah, if I see myself as a giant today when I'm being with you guys, if I see myself as a giant today when I'm in solitude, I'm taking time today, like all of a sudden I start to feel that giantness. Yeah, wow. So I'm, I'm hearing in this, there's a, there's a, not necessarily a process, but there is, right? Hmm. It's that when we think of creation, like I want to be this thing, we think of how, like how will I do it? And we come hmm. from the space of what we know. Hmm. And so we go after that thing from what we know, trying to create a pathway from our version of how it should be done based on what we know. Mm -hmm. And what you're offering here is a, is a different, totally different way of creating, which is to start speaking what you want to create, to see it, to visualize it, mm -hmm. which allows the emotion to come in. Mm -hmm. And then the how to sorts itself out. Mm -hmm. It's not that you're, you're creating your vision of, of whatever it is mm. uh, from the how to you're coming at it from the space of really experiencing it. Mm -hmm. and then letting the how-to come does that yeah that's a, that's spot on right i distinguish becoming a giant from being a giant mm -hmm. yeah becoming yeah. puts me on that path of like what are the things that i have to do in order to get to this place that i am a giant whereas mm -hmm. actually giant is always and only a state of being i'm using giant as a shorthand because sure, where sure. we're at right now right but like Perfect. it's a state of being and so if i want to be a giant then i'll be a giant in my being now see myself feel myself that way and then meet the world, boom. And what happens when I'm being something and circumstances show up, the, the product of my being in a circumstance is wow. a thought and an action. And so if I'm being giant and I meet a circumstance, a giant action comes out. If I'm being small and I meet a circumstance, a small action comes out. Yeah. Wow. I, I love the use. You're using, you're using things like this to yeah. really anchor it in. And that's what hypnotists do. They anchor yeah. it with things like that. Yeah. And so you no, have I'm hypnotized. Power. Did yeah, you know my background in hypnosis or are you just, what? is that just by chance? <laughs> no, I didn't know that. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. No, it's just observation from, from my experience with others, but I didn't know that about you. So, so the way I got into my work now, I mean, I've wow. always been into philosophy and stuff, but like, yeah, I was doing street magic, like David Blaine. Okay. And then I got, when I moved to the UK, I got yeah. into street hypnosis. Okay. So I was actually, I learned and studied hypnosis for years and how to actually be in conversation with the person and create an experience inside their mind through my speaking to create entertainment. Huh. And that's what led me. And, and I was also an entrepreneur. Then I started to see, well, if I can create an experience inside another person's mind through my speaking, and that can be fun. What if it actually could be useful for them in their life? And that's yeah. what led me into the work that I do now. Amazing. That's yeah. amazing. And I, and I experience that as I watch this. And, and what I love about this is I'm, I'm really slowing down in my conversation up here with you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you're sharing some things that if I go into auto mode, I'm going to miss it. Mm. And I don't want to miss it. Like mm. you're really sharing some nuggets already just in the first part of your journey. Mm. And so what, what I think people think is that once I have the vision then the rest should be pretty easy. There's no evolution. Mm -hmm. You talk about evolution and evolution as a process. It's evolving from one level to another, to another, and it's adding and taking away. And so can you talk about the path? Like, did you see a clear vision of where you would be today when you began? Or did, um, that, did that vision? Probably, but I'm not living in it. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't even remember exactly what it was. So, yeah. I mean, I, a, a, an important thing to share probably that's part of gives you an understanding of how I live and why I live the way that I live is I, I spent three years 
living out of a backpack, buying only one way tickets, traveling the world. So it was like a three years. I know you guys recently talking about serendipity, right? And synchronicity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like a deep schooling in that, you know, and there's yeah. cost to like my loss of my ability to make commitments and stuff. But the benefit of it was like really learning to trust my own heart and my, what I would love and my intuition and, and to, to kind of create my path. Um, but, um, I'm kind of losing track of what your question was. There was a reason no, I, don't even, I don't even know if it was a question, but more of a, a, a and it, you know, going into your experience of when you first began and you were, you were kind of floating in a way you were just going with the serendipity that came. Yes. But then, it, then it evolved and you've got this creation where you are today. Isn't oh, that's right. The vision, right? Yeah. 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 That's yeah. what I was going to say. So I think it's super important to have a North star. Yeah. And that to allow it to move. Uh, right. Well, like I always yeah. want to be headed towards something, but I don't care if that's where I end up. I want to be headed towards something because then I, the way that I move now is different when I'm headed towards something than the way that I move now when there's nothing to head towards. I won't even move if there's not something out there. Right. It's like yeah. wander around. So I move towards a vision because of what it creates in my body today in this moment and the experience of life that it gives me. Like right now, my wife and I are living towards a vision of raising our boys on a mountainside in Maui. And we're yeah. moving towards that, but not to get away from here. We love it here. We love Santa Monica. We love our house. We love our life. Right. But having a vision and moving towards it actually adds to the experience of now. Okay. Like I just learned how to grow vegetables for the first time in my life. I didn't do that as a kid. And that is a now expression of the vision of the garden on our land in Maui. That doesn't wow. exist yet, but it's like, it's actualized here. We see a life of relaxing in hammocks there and I bought hammocks at our home. So the vision creates the present. And as one of the things I teach them with my clients is like, your vision is the path. And what I mean by that is like, whatever you want out there, an instantiation of it in this moment, an expression of it in this moment is how you'll end up there. I love this. I, it, so we're gonna dive down a rabbit hole a cool. little bit. Okay. We're going to talk about capacity. So in, in the capacity of the vision is that you created that North star, like you said, mm -hmm. from what you, what you had. And so you might've ventured out into possibility on that. So here's, here's where I want to go with this is people love certainty. Mm -hmm. They think they love certainty, but they complain about it all the time. I hate my life. Right. Mm -hmm. They say mm -hmm. that. And, and yet they love mm -hmm. it because they know what to expect in their world. And then they'll venture out into probability, right? Mm. Maybe they might try something, but only if it's a pretty likely, uh, has a high likelihood of success, right? Yeah. But very rarely do they venture out into possibility, right? Or even impossibility, where it's like nothing is certain. And, and the value of, of what you're explaining here is that you're venturing out, you're creating a North Star called Hawaii on the mountainside mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And it's out in the world of possibility. Now it's more probable, you know, you're, you're, you're for you, it's getting into that mm -hmm. space of probability. And so you're creating things in your environment now that are indicative of that in mm -hmm. the future. Yeah. And so I want to speak to this because what happens is people get stuck in their box of certainty, the mm -hmm. life they know, and they rarely venture out into that because it's so scary to be in the uncertainty. But the uncertainty, like we mentioned in another show, the uncertainty is where the gold is. Yeah, that's where the adventure is. So can mm. can you speak to what comes up around that as you hear that? Mm. You know, I'm blessed to have a wife that has a very similar style of personality and way of relating to the world as I do. We're both with Enneagram sevens, which is like the adventurer, the explorer, and we kind of thrive on difference. Um, and I wouldn't say that we thrive on uncertainty because there's still a desire to feel safe and secure, but sure. I think that we get a certain uh, access to certainty through difference, through okay. newness. And so it's a bit of a, but I think it's actually a healthy and useful way of for, for, for people to, to access the safety they want, even if things are uncertain. So the way I'll summarize it is say is like, I have certainty in my uncertainty. Okay. Right, which means essentially is I'm okay with things changing. And this is a very similar to what the internal thing that I was talking about earlier, like weaponizing our self-awareness, judging ourselves for judging yourself. If I yep. can love that I hate myself, I'm much better off than if I hate that I hate myself. 
Mm. And if I can be certain that I'm uncertain, if I can be okay with things changing, then actually the reality of life that always changes is much easier to navigate. And it opens and it gives me so much more choice for the life I'm going to live. And it's so uh, I, I guess I'm kind of wanted to lean on and weigh on this point that it's like our meta relationship. It's our relationship to our, the things that are going on inside us, to the world that actually is most um, fundamental in our experience of being in the world. Like I, I remember when I was at university uh, and the, um, the president of our university at the commencement speech said, the only constant is change. And yeah. I was like, I mean, lots of people have heard that, but I was like, fuck that. I can be safe in change. Yeah. Yeah. You said Nick's second favorite F word. <laughs> the first one is fractal. Okay. <laughs> and Steve is probably giggling at home. We yeah. talked about fractals last time. Actually. Yes. Yeah, so we, we did. Talk about the other one for a second. Yeah. Well, I, like I want to talk about Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who wrote The Black Swan. Hmm. And his he's a he was a mathematician, but he talks about the importance of embracing uncertainty. And um, and that's the thing that most people avoid is that uncertainty. But if you can find comfort in the uncomfortable, mm -hmm. then that's where your life really starts to change. Mm -hmm. I had a conversation uh, last night in a course that I'm teaching, and and one of the questions was like, how how do I embrace that uncertainty? Like I feel afraid of that. Mm. I'd rather be in the certainty. And, and what we talked about is finding comfort, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. If you, yeah. If you, if you don't like public speaking, then start speaking in public. Mm -hmm. If you want to be confident, then start going out and doing things that are confident mm -hmm. and work through the discomfort of not being good at it for a while. Yeah. Right. I think that's the, that's for me, that's the first step because it's an attitude that has you look that in the eyes yeah. Wow. And, and walk forward. Right. And like, just let's take a very simple example. That's non-emotional, but just purely physical. Cause I think it's easy to, 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 to give people access to it. Yeah. If you're uncomfortable with the feeling of pain in your abs, when you do sit-ups, then you're not even going to do them. But if you're comfortable with that discomfort, hmm. then you'll at least do them. And then through doing them and being present with the, the ab work, being comfortable with being uncomfortable in that ab work actually gives you the opportunity to create a relationship with that where there's still pain, but there's not suffering. Hmm. Yeah. And so you right. actually become comfortable with the pain, which is different than being comfortable with the discomfort of the pain. Okay. So I want to hit on a word there. Yeah. Uh, the word passion. Yeah. Right? Passion means to suffer. I know. Yeah. But why, why is it that we will be passionate about things Mm. But we don't want to suffer through things, yet they mean mm. the same thing. Yeah. And and that's what you're know. describing right here. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I that's something for me to definitely think about because I've been really perplexed by that word and it's and it's two almost two sided meaning. So yeah. Um, yeah. So so what I hear is finding comfort in the discomfort. Like well, that that's the first stage. That that well okay. that says I'm gonna I'm up for this experience. Okay. But then that, but then immersing yourself in that experience with willingness then gives you the opportunity to create an even a, a, a more, a, a deeper relationship with that experience that shifts it even further. Hmm. So like, I'm uncomfortable with being, uh, I'm comfortable with being uncomfortable with change. Yeah, right? yeah. But then yeah. your willingness to be, expose yourself to change comes from that. But then once you expose yourself to that change, now you have the chance to actually look at, okay, what am I actually afraid of happening? And then you have the opportunity to have a more nuanced and subtle and specific conversation with yourself. And that, well, I'm, well, the change I'm afraid of is like, well, what if I move to Maui and I don't have the same kind of community that I have here? And it's like, oh, wow, what's that about? It's like, well, what if it's just like it was when I was, I was in fourth grade? Mm. And it's like, oh, that's what's going on here. I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to play kickball in this moment. And then I get to have that deeper conversation and forgive myself for judging myself as small and little and not wanted. I love it. And so I don't get to do any of that work if I don't take the step into change, which I'm not going to do if I do that thing that we were just talking about, which is say I'm comfortable with the discomfort of change. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to talk about what Steve just posted there, but I want to cool. talk about this even more before we go to that which is you're creating a relationship with this change. So it's an all inness with that mm -hmm. change. And so 
the thing that we do is we dance around it. Like, yeah, I'd like if I were to put it into a relationship sense in the way that we traditionally think about that, right? We, we have a partner mm -hmm. and, and we think, you know, I'm going to date and do these things, but I'm not going to commit to it. Like I'll experience it, but it's only surface level, right? right. Like you were talking that first step there. The second step is moving into that relationship where there's a commitment to the thing, mm -hmm. to really being with it. Right. And so whether that's with a person or something else, what you're offering here is that there are relationships that are created, not just with people, but with all of our experiences in our lives. Yes. Am yes. I and, 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 and the less I even distinguish people from experiences, the, the easier everything gets. Huh. Right. And so like, you know, it's like, oh, there's a relationship with that person and there's a relationship with myself. And those are two different things, but they're similar. It's like, actually, it's the same thing. So the experience is yes. what you're saying. Is, yes. you, is you guys are experiences present. as well for me. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. me relating to you is, is an expression <laughs> of me relating to myself in the form of the idea of you that lives as me. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Can you say that again? Can you repeat yeah. that? Or is that a like one time? So if you met my wife, you'd meet yep. a different wife than the wife that I have. Yeah. You have yeah. your version of Kalpna. Ryan would have his version of Kalpna and I have my version of Kalpna. Yeah. And we each have a relationship with that version. Wow. And I would say the version of a person that we have inside of us, which is what we actually have relationship is an, is an extension and part of the self. Yeah. So there is no other, other than the aspect of self that I put out on that body. Yeah. And wow. So all the self work is other work. And so as I, in, as I practice this journey inwardly about my little John and get reconnected and free and get connected to big John, I am giant, right? Like as I yeah. do that, I'm actually improving my relationship to my wife. Not like if I can do it here, then I can do it there. I'm improving my relationship to myself. One aspect of which is count the subscript John. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I love it. Yeah. yeah. When you go from that space, let's say as being giant, I mm -hmm. am giant. And you approach that situation or that event, that that person, we'll call a person an event in this case, and you create that experience, but you're being giant, then you're going to approach it different than if you're being small. Mm. And you're going to have a completely different experience by depending on how you choose to go into that conversation or that, that event, right? Yeah. yeah. The event is neutral. The person is neutral. Our projection is not. Mm. And- Correct me, like clarify with me if if I'm venturing no, spot on. Yeah. That. Um, so I love this because what what you're bringing to the table here, and if and this is going to be a deep conversation that people might want to listen to over and over. And I, I'm going to go back through it. Awesome. Is that there's some things inside of here that really the only thing that you have is your experience. Yes. Which comes from your judgments, mm -hmm. and when you recognize that it's your judgments that are at play, the only thing you can forgive is yourself for judging yourself. Mm. And, and so that allows you to move forward. And as you, yeah. yeah and as you do that, you experience things differently or yeah. create different experiences mm. or a version of a, of a different experience. Mm. Yeah. So I'm curious about dry rain. <laughs> Steve, I didn't see his message. Did he say something <laughs> yeah. about dry rain? Sounds Talk like a dry rain. Sounds like a Prince yeah. song or something. Dry rain. I know that's what I said to him. I was like, "Is a there's a different song with rain in it." He said, um, "Purple rain, purple rain." Yeah, that's, that's, what, <laughs> that's yeah. what we should do. A purple rain, like just like change the words and make it a dry rain song. That's dry rain, dry yeah. rain. I just have this image of Steve. I work uh, in nature singing. I don't think that's my projection of myself on myself. There. Yeah. What's your image of Steve? We so need to I know just this. Want to think of the like the first time he said the the, the distinction dry rain in one of our sessions. He said, I can just picture him. It's rain and it's dry. And it's, it's, it's like, it was like so intense and it's Salt like, it's rain pepper. and it's dry. It's like, you think that's not possible? It is. And it was like, oh. um, but to me, I mean, that's what this is. <laughs> that's, what, yeah. that's what this is for me on my wall, right? It's, it's the Tao. It's, it's both. And it's that paradox. It's where, yeah, you know, wow. that where people see contradiction. Yep. There's actually um, paradox, which is where something looks to be contradictory, but it's actually both sides are true. Right. And you know what? Steve didn't know this when he created dry rain. 
but I actually did some Googling and there is a very rare weather phenomena called dry rain, huh. which is when it dries, but I think it's like the ground is so hot that it evaporates before it hits the ground. Uh. And so that's a, it's like a literal physical expression of the possibility of it both raining and being dry that's at the same time. Interesting, because so one person could be like getting hit with rain. Yeah, and the other person says it's not raining. <laughs> looking on the ground, yeah, you can't see right. any any wetness on the ground. Yeah, but it's everywhere. Everywhere you start to look, or it's like it can't be both this and that. It has to be this or that. I mean, very much in the Western world, we live in in, in, in a world that's an expression of this or that. We can't have both. And dry rain is like a is like the is like a constant reminder that yeah. both can exist simultaneously. So that's passion is the ultimate dry rain. There. That's there where it makes sense, right? Way to bring it back. Yeah, <laughs> it it's love and suffering in the Dow. Yeah, that's it's what I think of when I think of Steve Hardison too. You watch his, you watch anything, any clip that he posts, anything yeah. like that, where he's carrying somebody. Yeah, dry rain, baby. Dry rain, baby. Dry rain. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so you're at this point in your life where you're exploring kind of your future and, mm. and you've created visions. I don't even know where I want to go with this at this point. I want to, mm. I want to keep exploring your philosophy because mm. what I love about it is that you're really putting the onus of creation back into the individual. Mm. And so let, let's maybe venture down that a little bit, because what I see in the world, what I experience in the world, um, and this is based on what I, I know within me, right? Is mm -hmm. that there's this, this desire to put it out there on others. If this mm -hmm. had occurred, then I could do that. And yeah. so it, it creates this ease in a way of not having to face that, like put your eyes on it and really look at it. And so, yeah, can you speak? Yeah, to that? yeah I, um, this, one of the central questions in my work, and this is a question that I have clients that I work with for five years or more on this one question, because the depth of the power that it gives you is, is, is infinite. Um, and that question is simply, how am I creating this? Huh. Uh, and the, what that question does is it does exactly what you're seeing. It takes whatever is occurring in the world out there or in here, and it puts the, the, the locus of power directly inside you. Now, that question is extremely challenging and confronting for people when they don't have dry rain hmm. because you you'd be like oh that means i'm at fault that means See, i'm guilty like one -sided, yeah right and so it's like a weapon it's like oh how did i do that it's like oh whoosh, right whoosh. and so you need to dry rain it you need to be able to be like how am i creating this and i am always innocent in everything that i create and do yeah yeah but when you can hold both of those you get an immense access to power wow how am i the instigator and the victim right in a way well, yeah, those are both like loaded, <laughs> heavily not <non -innocent, laughs> like laden words, but like, yeah, yeah. That's, that's my intention is like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the most extreme loaded yeah, question yeah. or loaded How word. How am I like both violent and yeah, it's like, yeah, wow. yeah. So, well, so, so yeah. Philip Zimbardo talks about the, the ability that each of us has to go towards really dark paths. We mm -hmm. do, we have it within us. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so what people tend to deny is that they have that. Oh, I'd never mm -hmm. do anything like that. You yes. know, I could never be a Hitler. I could never be this type of person. But the truth is, it, it's it's in there. Absolutely. Yeah. And so talking about dry rain is this ability to be deeply loving and deeply hurtful. Mm -hmm. We have that within it, as well as a bunch of other distinctions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you ask a question of how am I creating this, it's looking mm -hmm. at all sides of it. Mm -hmm. Like it's more of what's my contribution? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's accurate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Everything that's created is co-created. Right. right. As long as you're seeing things as separate, that's, that would be the closest answer or truth to that for me. Yeah. Um, so for sure. But, but here's the thing. There's the yeah. intellectual, philosophical, analytical reality or whatever you could say that everything is co-created. Right. But even that diffuses and decentralizes my access to my power because it kind of like moves me out. So I play the game of pretending I as a separate individual entity created this in the totality because it's through that illusory perspective that I have access to the highest degree of my agency. That's mm. where I have that, that illusion is where I have the most power. And so I play in that space to create. Yeah, yeah, delusion, but, right? Yeah. Illusion and delusion, but in yeah. a sense it works because the, 
the idea of creating the way that you're talking about is in a way could be defined as delusional. Yes. Right. Because you're stepping out into a world that doesn't exist. It, it would be like Columbus going out and saying, there's a new, there's another world out there. Mm -hmm. People would call him delusional. In fact, mm -hmm. any explorer, they did. Yeah. When, when they went away from a flat earth to a round earth and, and then back to a flat earth, there's delusions on all sides of it. But it's, yeah. it's, it's in that delusion that possibility is created when nothing is yes. certain, everything is possible. Yeah. So my friend James says, get in the box, but don't close the lid. Huh. Right? Wow. So, so I, I go all in, but I don't believe that that's the truth. Yeah. So wow. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's a, this is why I call my philosophy, the creating perspective, which is, which was inspired by, um, what's the guy's n name who wrote the book? Um, Steve actually referred it to me. It was about the universe. Um, anyway, the, what he says is in the universe, the reason that it's important to like learn about the universe is because it gives us the, a cosmic perspective. Right. And when we have a cosmic perspective, it, it gives us a sense of being connected to and in union with everybody here. Cause we're not so like caught up on our differences. Yeah. And so it's like, it's not like it's the truth, but it's a perspective. When we stand in this position, it gives us access to an experience. And so for me, the creating perspective is just that. When I stand in the perspective that I create everything, my access to freedom, to love, to power goes way up. And so I'll stand there whenever I want freedom, love, or power, which most of the time for me. Yeah. yeah. So I'm thinking of the book, The Idea of the World, that talks about consciousness hmm. and how science has gotten back so far that that they can't get beyond consciousness. They go to a mm -hmm. quark and, and photons and, and neutrinos and all these things, but they get to a point where there's something beyond it all. Mm -hmm. And it permeates everything that exists. It holds it together mm -hmm. because without that consciousness, nothing would exist. And so there's this idea that we have, it's almost like this, um, like you talked about dissociation. Mm -hmm. It's like consciousness created alternate personalities mm -hmm. called humans. Mm -hmm so that it could experience this delusion called individuality in a mm. way. And, and mm. so that's where his basis is. It's really interesting how he looks at it. Mm. But the idea is that within each of us is this consciousness and we're all connected because of that. So even while we have this illusion of being individual, we're all still connected. Yeah. So whether you call that God or consciousness or whatever, it's that cosmic global perspective that we're all part of the same thing. And we are, mm. we're physically mm. connected. Mm. Um, even beyond physically connected. I mean, you yeah. zoom in on us and we're all just open space. Mm -hmm. And so what you're talking about is getting in the box, but not closing the lid is keeping that connection open. Mm -hmm. My understanding of it to, to everything that's out there, every human that's out there, every possibility that's out there. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't have the truth ever. Mm. That's right. Huh? I think well, maybe yeah, that's, right. <laughs> that's right. Let's box that one. Yeah. In. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I've been sitting here thinking about this and going, okay, well, you know, the title of this this whole thing was how to achieve the life that you were meant to live. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, what's the life I was meant to live? Whatever mm. you choose. And that see, that's what yeah. I was thinking. Like, is there mm. there's not a right or a wrong? There's there's mm -hmm. what you you know what you decide. I think mm. tapping into like you've been talking about, about tapping into creation. Mm. Mm. And the, the beauty behind that, but also the, I, don't, I mean, some could get overwhelmed. Mm. I think you can start with, with small things. Right. And, and, and work up to it, you know, yes. like, like people could see you JP. I mean, Steve Hardison just threw you down a, a massive, massive, uh, I don't know, just too big, a, an amazing too big for the screen. Yeah, yeah. Too, too big for the screen. Um, just to compliment oh, about how you'll cool. go down as one of the world's greatest philosophers and one of the most powerful men to walk I, the earth. I'm feeling that. So I want to highlight something about you that I'm experiencing as, as we're on the show is that there will be people who want to share all that they know. Mm -hmm. And then there will people, there will be people who really sit with what's being shared on the other side of the table mm -hmm. and really hear it, feel it, drive it into their experience. And then, offer some ideas and, and possibilities from that. Mm -hmm. And as I experience you, what I hear is as Ryan's talking, you're, you're, you're just almost like eating food. You're like, Hmm, right. Mm -hmm. Like you, you mm -hmm. just satiated something within you in that experience of listening to him. Mm -hmm. 
And this is a, a model that people could really adopt for themselves of, do I want to be right and really have all the answers or do I want to enjoy the food, right? In a, in a sense, enjoy yeah. the experience. What do you hear in that? Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, well, I appreciate the acknowledgement, first of all, from Steve and from you and that um, I'm present to the way that you listen and what you see in when a person speaks both here and also throwing back to the, the hypnotist thing. So that's yeah. pretty sweet. And I love that. Um, I mean, it's, it kind of nails my experience. I'm kind of, um, I'm, I'm, I'm more hungry for the next understanding than I am um, mm -hmm. concerned with the understanding that I have even, even being valuable or useful to people, which is important to me. Yeah. But it's like, I'm ready and willing to drop anything that I brought today. If something that shows up here is going to move it forward. And like yeah, wow, the, pa wow. The, the passion thing, like, Oh, that's, you know, what you shared. And then what Steve said to you, like, that's going to advance me and my understanding and that'll find its way into, to my world. And um, yeah, that's how yeah. I experienced Steve Hardison eating gelato. <laughs> cool. Cause he would ask us and you know, talk about our life <clears throat> and they go, Hmm. Did like he actually we were, like, we were right, like, we're like, like we were right in what we were doing yeah. and thinking and feeling yeah. with no judgment, just, yeah. just, you know, just understanding where we are or how we be. Well, even, even the experience of somebody coming up and calling you an asshole, yeah. there's still some satiation that can occur in that, in that experience It's like tasting really bitter food and going, Oh, this is terrible. You got to taste it. Mm, you got to try mm, this. Right. Mm, mm. But we look at that as though it means something about us. Mm. It's like they say that thing to us, you are this thing. And that could be any label that they want to throw out. Mm. And if, if you take it in and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's me. And that that judgment really fits. And I'm going to anchor that in like that's the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the reality is it's just passing by. It's just mm. an experience. It's an event. It's not yeah. even an experience. The experience comes later. Yeah. It's just that's an event. Hard. I, I, I what the art. The example you're giving, I kind of articulate it by like I call it shithead versus poopoo head. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's hear it. The content yeah. is essentially the same, but yeah, in those two words, you know that one is said by a five year old or four year old, and the other one right. is said by an adult, right? Well, I'm gonna and, start saying poopoo head to everybody. Yeah, yeah, poo -poo yeah. head. But people a person can say shithead and you can hear poopoo -poo head. Yeah. Well wow. when you yeah. do that, what you're doing is you're leaving the content, but you're you're bringing the innocence online. Hmm. Cause it's like my, I have a five-year-old and a one-year-old I mentioned and, and the five-year-old pulls the same curtain as the one-year-old. And I say, and I, my, the way of being when I'm not present and conscious it, with my five-year-old is not as the same as it is with my one-year-old. And that's where I was like, Whoa, what's going on here? Same curtain, same pull, same problem. Yeah. Same like thing being pulled off the wall, but different energy towards it. Asher, sure, stop pulling the curtain. You know better. Or it's like, Oh no, Rumi, don't pull the curtain, bud. It's like so cute that he's doing yeah. it. <laughs> what's that about? That's poo poo head shit head. <laughs> it's a creation in me I where I take innocence out of the equation and I, and I, and I, and I, and I project on you're not lovable if you are not doing the right thing, which is my own fearful yeah, self. Yeah, yeah. My and version of fear of not being loved in place of innocence makes that expression a bit uglier. Yeah. And so it's the same thing in when somebody says shithead, if I can actually see them, like I see Rumi pulling the curtain, if I can see poo poo head coming out of their mouth, I'm seeing the innocence in their action and the perfection in it, and and I'm not like triggering myself as much. Yeah, well, even even bib biblically going into that, you know, because I like to pull wherever it is the yeah, information man. that comes. So what comes up is, you know, Christ is on the cross and he says, "Forgive them; they don't know what they do," which was his version of calling, you know, calling it a poo poo head, right? <laughs> in a way, yeah. it's, it's like that that could have been taken very harmfully. Mm -hmm. Yet in a way, it was reframed. And, and shown as an experience of even in that position where it could mm -hmm. be deemed really hard mm -hmm. in that passion that he was going through, right? Mm -hmm. That that he was able to distinguish one from the other. And it was all a creation within him, just yeah. like it's a creation within us, you know, for, for him to say, well, whatever I've done, you can do and even more actually. Mm -hmm. And and then we come back and we're like, no, no I can't. And, and then we get to be right in that. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So like, which is funny because in a way, like I also practice saying inwardly, forgive me for I know not what I do. Yeah. Okay. Which is essentially a, a parallel to, I forgive myself for judging myself because yeah. I'm innocent. I can only do what I'm doing in any moment with my thinking, the body, the world. The, it's like, and so what I'm actually saying is, is 
this is some dry rain right here is I don't create anything. I'm just being created in every moment. Yeah. Which is like, how am I creating this is the opposite of that. And so I didn't do it. It's just happening. And I couldn't have done anything different is like, it's like, that's where the freedom is. Mm. And from that place where now I'm free, now I'm like, it's okay. I'm okay. Then it's like, okay. And how did I create that? Yeah. Not like bring the whip back, but like, let me step into it and see where my agency is without the guilt, without the shame, without the blame. Yeah. The, ju the judgment the external judgment, we think we need to bring into our world to put on that, that experience. Right. Right. And so it's, and, and I say, right. And you agree with me. You could totally disagree. You'd be like wrong. Don't worry. I will, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. So we're moving in the same direction there, but there's this opportunity to really look at the creation the way it is. Like there is never, anything wrong in your world if you really step mm -hmm. back and look at it because mm -hmm. everything is working in your favor mm -hmm. the reality is otherwise it wouldn't be in your space mm -hmm. and so no matter how it might be perceived it's it's really there for you yeah there's a uh, there's a comment here that i think might be something that's on multiple people's mind because this was what was on my mind i'm going to pull it up but it's yeah. big so it's going to block you a little bit jp says, is there not something deeper within us that is meant to live or does it exist as a paradox, a chase, a quest, an, an, uh, an, illusor, what, an illusory idea that teases us from a distance, never to be fully known, but simply love for what is, non-existent yet appearing to be? Any thoughts on that? Mm, I mean, I think I, th I like the question. Thank you, Emmerich. Um, and, I, and it sounds like he's like kind of referring to that line, achieve a life you're meant to live, which I think mm -hmm. you got probably wrap, grabbed off my website. Um, and uh, my good friend Gil wrote that line, who was a client for a long time. Um, and then I hired him to help me kind of articulate my message because he was doing a better job than I was doing at it. Yeah. Um, but I think I want to change that to achieve a life you are meant to live, not were meant to live. Um, just because that feels closer to what uh, I actually experience, which is along the lines of what you were saying, actually, Nick, like um, what we choose and decide the meaning that we create, but we are meant to live through the meaning that we choose and decide to create. Um, and, and I also want to just respond to Emmerich's question, maybe would be my answer. I don't know, but it certainly seems like there are um, propensities, um, things that have come up in me from before I started having this illusion of that I have choice anyway. Like there's the ancestral stuff. There's the neural patterning that happens in the womb. So like, yes, I think there probably is. Um, do I believe that it's that there's a specific form in the world? Not so much. Like I well, met a woman in England. Like what? Like, prede like predestiny, yeah, right? The, so like, it's a, it's a, it's a dry rain. Like I met okay. a woman in England whose mission in life was to save the bears in China. And it's like, maybe that's specifically what was, she was destined to do, or maybe in her had the capacity to love beings and like an experience she had with animals. And so yeah. it's both, it's like in the same way, it's like nurture and nature. Yeah. Like there's something before and there's things that happen. So, um, yeah, yeah to, to separate that out would would be to separate our humanity in a way. It's like yeah. we're we are complex creatures. I mean, we're made of 50 trillion cells that hold mm -hmm. themselves together pretty effectively. Mm -hmm. And we look at it, we think it's solid, yet it's mostly empty space. Mm -hmm. you, it's you amazing, take, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, you take all seven trillion or seven seven trillion. Yeah, I'm adding numbers, seven billion people in the world, and you take out all the space and they'd fit in the, the space the size of a sugar cube. Like wow. that's how Dude, much empty no, space there is. Yeah. Wow. Yet we think we're solid. And so yeah. that question, you know, to me, it's like as a possibility, yes. And, and I'm open to the idea that I get to create it all. So, and, and things like I say that I'm a philosopher and I am, yeah. but I think the thing that's important to distinguish is there's like a lot of times people think about philosophy as like armchair pontificating and then yeah. it has no real, implication or pragmatic application in your life right. and i'm a philosopher even within a 24-hour period only to the extent that it actually informs my experience and then changes and influences the way that i engage with the world okay and so i kind of 
I kind of lose focus when things become so out there that when I don't have any sense of what that actually does right, for right, me right. here and now. Right. Um, and so that's why I say maybe, I mean, and if, if that informed my experience now, then I would like grab onto that and do something with it. Yeah. Is it useful, right? Would be a question yeah. or is it, yeah. does it move me toward what I'm creating? Yeah. Or is it beautiful as well? Yeah. Know, wow. like, okay. like, you, but being utility. open to the possibilities or to the newness that, that could affect or change your, your being. Well, yeah. you, you just hit a nugget there that I, I almost miss, man. Is it beautiful? Like how many things do we look at yeah. and we just enjoy them because of their beauty? Like mm -hmm. there's nothing to do with it, but to savor it. Yeah. That, that distinction, um, utility versus beauty. I think I would say, um, I was really informed by Ian McGilchrist's work who wrote the master and his emissary. He's, um, a psychologist, neuroscientist, uh, and it's about the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Okay. And how the, and the left hemisphere's primary function is in service of usefulness, utility. Yeah. And the right hemisphere's primary function is in service of the whole, which is where beauty and awe and all that comes and, from. And yeah, so wow. enjoyment. Yeah. And it's a riff on Einstein saying the master is the essentially your imagination. And it's and but it's we've kind of got it the wrong way around. And right. so like we believe the left brain, the usefulness is the master, but it's like the true master is the is the ability to see the whole. And yeah. So, um, and so I've just noticed how much of my orientation is, is it useful? Is it useful? Is it useful? And I think that's a useful question, but also, is it beautiful? Is it beautiful? Is it beautiful? Wow, is yeah, it yeah. Meeting life? And I try to dry rain it like a little bit of both. I love that. that that's new for me. I'm going to take that into my world here. Cool. So yeah, there's opportunity in that. I think of uh, the possibilities would occur, the imagination, the illusion, right? Would all occur in that right hemisphere. Mm -hmm. And the utility of how to how to do it would come from the left. So really, when yeah. we look at the vision, right, and we're creating that vision, and we're fully in that vision, we're using the right hemisphere to create that vision. And then our left comes in with all of the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And, and we want to be one sided. No, it needs to be useful, or it needs to be beautiful, but not both. And, and mm -hmm. it's really is complementary. It's yin and yang. Mm -hmm. It's our brain is mm -hmm. working the way that you're talking about everything here. It's the Tao. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, just huh? That's it's huh. got my mind spinning, huh. right? Like, awesome. yeah. <laughs> um, so we're, we're coming toward the end of this, and I'm I'm wondering, you know, if there was one piece of ad, not advice, wisdom, that you would share with people from your experience, what would be? And I know I know you have a lot, but what came to mind immediately when when you heard that? What would you share? Mm, love everything. Okay, That's, you know, um, I think I had Ram Dass say that. Um, in, in a little documentary, um, but it's just what, what, when you said, if there was wisdom, if it was one thing, it was like, boom, that's it. And I think that's because oh. there's nothing to me that's more important uh, in giving me access to freedom, love, power. Those are like my, my core values um, in this present moment. You know, I've heard there's a beautiful book that Steve's got like a picture of holding. I haven't read it yet, but it's uh, called, yeah. um, um, what's it called? Whatever Arises, Love That by a guy named okay. um, Matt something. Um, and that uh, idea, loving what is. That's, his, that's his exact last name, Matt something. Matt something. Matt something. Yeah. I think Matt, yes. Matt Kahn maybe. I haven't read it, so I'm plugging the book yeah. because the title's so beautiful. Um, yeah. The work of Byron Katie, loving what is. Mm. Um, and, and you know, I'm deep into Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche talks about yeah. Amor Fati, which is love of fate. Okay. And it's like, it's so this, you know, this, present like loving what's occurring now i say love to death what you hate huh right if you love something that you hate it, to death it will like the hate thing that goes away you just and then you're just left with love and so um yeah so, so i've got a question around that so this is yeah. what comes up for me as i hear that so the word love if if I were to strip it down, I would see it as pure acceptance of what mm. is mm. and pure acceptance of it, of another human acceptance, right? The, the idea that I can take it as given, right? If you look at the word acceptance, that's what that word means is to take mm -hmm. as given and to receive mm -hmm. it. And so to love would be to take people, places, things, the beauty, the ugly, all of it as it is and to mm -hmm. receive it as it mm -hmm. is. Mm. That's my version of it. Yeah, and it's so awesome. I'm, I'm wondering if that uh, if that would also apply in your version of it. It does, and I'll have to share because I was just presencing myself to this this morning with, with the word acceptance. Yeah, I'm a yes to that, 
And then within acceptance, I create a distinction that takes that yes and it breaks it into a yes and a no. Okay. Yeah. And so I'd love to hear. the aspect of acceptance that you're referring to, I keep and it's a yes. And I call the aspect of acceptance that you're referring to allowing. Huh. And then the no part is the way I summarize it is allow everything, which huh. is love everything, the allowing aspect of it. The no part is accommodate very little. So what I do in my external time and space in my physical world is the accommodation. What I do in my heart is the allowing. So I allow everything, but that doesn't mean that I accommodate it. If somebody wants to take something from me, it's like in my heart, yeah, fine. Am I actually gonna accommodate that? My time, my kids, I'm not gonna accommodate it, but I am gonna allow it because if I don't allow it, I suffer. Yeah, but if wow. I accommodate everything because I think the only way I can allow is to accommodate, then I actually am a leaf in the wind. I'm at effect to the world. Mm. So I want peace in my heart, but I also want to produce to to riff back to Steve the where oh, you know peace yeah. and production he talks about. But like I want to create in the physical yeah. world, and so that means that I have to bring to bear love in the form of desire on the world, my values yeah. on the world, while I'm also bringing love to bear in my heart in the form of peace and allowance. These were my thoughts exactly as I was presencing this morning as well. <laughs> Sweet, dude. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. I, no, now is, they are, that though. Is, that is deeply, deeply I'm going to allow and words. accommodate. Yeah. yeah two yeah, words that mean the same thing. Deeply and profound. That was deeply profound. I'm saying the same thing. That was deep. That was beautiful. Cool. Uh, to allow versus accommodate and really look at the distinction that's created in that. And it's not about right or wrong. Even the words right and wrong or good and evil, if you go back to the Aramaic on that, it was actually ripe and unripe. Mm-hmm. It was never good and, and evil. It was ripe and unripe. Mm-hmm. And so these distinctions are very important because they they shift the way that we look at things. Yeah. And um, man, I, I just, you know, I, I feel like I could dive into your brain. Mm-hmm. For hours. Come on in. You know, yeah, yeah. Come on yeah. in. The water's warm. <laughs> yeah, the, the lid is open. Yeah. Yeah, the is open. We'll, 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 uh, we'll go ahead and end it here. Ryan, did you have any additional thoughts? You know, uh, I'm, I have to go back through and um, watch it again because I think there's things that, as I rehear it, are, are going to open and expand um, my views Yeah, and allow me to be uh, more present hmm. and see... Uh, a, a different and a, and a and a and a probably a more beautiful perspective. Mm. Um, hmm. I just I just the the possibility thinking behind all of this. Mm. It it it's not mind blowing. It's it's freeing. Mm. It's beautiful. It's it's expansive, and um, what we have inside of uh, all of us, it's all there. We, we get to choose this. We can see it however we want to see it. We can build whatever we want to build and, and experience the world in, in, in an, a beautiful way or in a poo-poo head way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> however we yeah. want to do that. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's some of my biggest takeaways there. Is, is, uh, I, I got a lot today. JP. And uh, I know that a lot of our viewers did as well. And the ones that'll catch it later on a replay are going to, are going to be blessed and, and, uh, or, or not, they can do whatever they want to do with it. But I'll tell you what, I, I sure appreciate your time. Yeah. I appreciate your wisdom and in, in being the version of yourself that you've created today. Mm-hmm. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you so much. Both of you guys have really enjoyed being here. I love what you guys are doing. I love the book. Um, so thank you very, very much. Yeah. It's beautiful, man. I, uh, yeah, I love it. Like I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm just in awe, man. I watch you just listen to Ryan or me or talk and, and you just sit back and you're, you're easily willing. It's almost like, uh, Indiana Jones, right? He's got the, the golden statue in the sand and it's like, mm-hmm. you might come in with what you think is a golden statue, but it's a bag of sand. You'll easily trade it. Right. Mm-hmm. For something you think that would be mm-hmm. more powerful in your life. And, and what an example for all of us. Mm-hmm. To be able to do that is to take our our beliefs, the things we hold true and dear, mm. and to be willing to swap them out. Right? Mm. Like, thank I you mean, for. Uh, yeah. I, I just let me interject, and like this yeah. is something. Um, 
something spiritual, something bigger, the greater than all of us guiding this conversation, because this isn't the first time this has happened. But that is the exact metaphor that I use when I teach people how to forgive themselves and free themselves from an idea that's a judgment. Huh. So the space opens and I talk about Indiana Jones and that exact scene and the huh. chalice sand and i say there's a window there's a moment your heart can speak and you can actually bring forth into creation a new truth of who you are largely drawing on the work i did with steve like really but giving that that metaphor and so just thank you so much for being so connected to me in this conversation that you're kind of downloading what i am oh. even without like the words you are inside you're inside my brain already so beautiful huh. thank you i feel i'm feeling emotion around that right now. yeah it's awesome yeah, wow. thank you um, yeah, let's let's go and wrap it there. Like, pay pay attention. Like, okay, no, I want to hit one more thing real quick. Okay. <laughs> like what, what you just highlighted right there, because what my whole experience, what Steve does when he did the top hat tour, what what I did that week going out there, what you just experienced right here and just shared is that it's not as hard as you think. You don't have. To, I didn't. I didn't sit there and well, and tune into you and just think. Well, I need to make sure that I'm in the spirit of J, JP so that I can fully tune into his brain and pull out Indiana Jones. Right? There wasn't any of that. Mm. It's just being fully present allowed for that to occur. There was no doing yeah. on my part. There was being on my part, and it just mm -hmm. happened to be that 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 experience happened twice now in, in the. Uh, mm -hmm in the show. And that's by full presence. And yeah. so what I experienced when I was in California was full presence with whatever was, there was no trying or doing, it was just being present and there was no wrong way of doing it. And so I just wanted to hit on that real quick. Awesome, I promise. I'm done. Yeah, we better yeah. hit, we better hit stop or else we're going to go yeah. another hour. <laughs> yeah. I've got like 17 things. I'm like, all right, shh, got it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for watching. Catch us on YouTube, Facebook, join the tribe of giants. Make sure you re read the book. If you haven't read it yet, go grab a copy of it. Our vision is hundred million people impacted documented people around the world and a uh, Pixar animated movie that awesome. uh, these are our visions. And so if you want to support us in that, please do reach out to us. Let us know how you would like to be a part of that. Uh, we can create this. So JP, thank you, man. Thanks for being You're who welcome. you are. Thank you, Ryan. Right. Thank you, Nick. Much love, guys. All right. Take care. Bye.